show right here on 9, 10 a.m. The Superstation, the Future Radio. I'm your host, Brother Michael M. Hotel. It is Friday, June 4th, 2021, and we are live. Hope everybody's doing well today. It's been a very, very busy day. Um, I did Roland Martin Unfiltered today. I'm usually a panelist each Friday on Roland Martin Unfiltered, so did that show for two hours. Then had to regroup and get ready to do this show. So it's been a very busy week. Uh, we know we had the 100th commemoration of um, the Tulsa Race Massacre. That was on uh, Tuesday, June 1st. And we've been talking about it, uh, different aspects of the Tulsa Race Massacre past few days. Um, today on Roller Martin Unfiltered, one of the topics was dealing with Florida and the Okoy Massacre, or Okoy, Okoy Massacre in Florida, which took place November 2nd, 1920. It's the um, worst case of um, election day violence uh, in the history of this country. We've talked about the Okoy Massacre before. And you had at least 50 African-Americans who were killed uh, trying to exercise their right to vote. Many of them trying to uh, trying to vote. But uh, you had a white mob that uh, attacked African-Americans after killing one of them, after lynching uh, uh, Julius July Perry. And this took place on Election Day, November 2nd, 1920, November 2nd, 1920. Well, there um, in uh, Florida, there was a, a initiative from uh, State Representative Randolph Bracey to try to get some type of reparations for the uh, descendants of the Akoi massacre, the descendants of uh, those victimized. And Governor Ron DeSantis um has just signed into law as part of uh their fiscal year budget it's uh scholarships uh 50 scholarships of up to $6,100 for um descendants of the survivors of the Koi massacre and this is as a form of reparations even though they're not calling re- calling it reparations in the actual bill, okay, in the actual um, language of the bill. On Roland Martin Unfiltered today, Roland uh, spoke with State Representative uh, Randolph Bracey, okay, and, I, you know, because of, the, because of time, we didn't get a chance to ask State Representative any questions because I had information already on the Koi Massacre laid out and questions I wanted to ask. And I, we've talked about the Koi massacre here on the show before, back uh, around November 2nd of um, 2020, which was the 100th anniversary of the Koi massacre. We talked about it here. So I want to discuss that some. There was a story from um, MiamiNewTimes.com, MiamiNewTimes.com about this, but also Fox Channel 13 in the... Um, uh, Florida area, they have a story on this also. And this deals with using the state legislature and trying to find different ways to provide some type of restitution or reparations, et cetera. Uh, working within the state legislature, they were able to put this into the uh, state fiscal year budget and uh, get this implemented. Now, while a lot of people are talking about, you know, all these fantastical ideas for reparations, but can't produce any evidence, but can't, but can't produce any uh, any substance, can't produce any results, you have something like this taking place. Now, do they want more for the descendants? Yes. But this is what you can do right now. Florida approved scholarship fund as reparations for 1920 massacre. We'll talk about that. And then 
you may have seen this uh, story that we posted from the griot.com on our Facebook fan page, The African History Network, The African History Network. Uh, the three survivors of the Tulsa Race Massacre have been, um, they've been gifted $100,000 each from the Justice for Greenwood uh, nonprofit organization, the Justice for Greenwood nonprofit organization. Mother Viola Fletcher, uh, 107 years old, Mother Lessie Benningfield Randall, 106 years old, and Hughes Van Ellis, uh, Mother Fletcher's brother, he's 100 years old. They were they were gifted this, and it's a great story. Now, this is not coming from the city of Tulsa. This is not coming from the Oklahoma, uh, uh, the, the Oklahoma government. It's not coming from that. All right, because I was looking at you know we posted about this on our Facebook fan page, the African History Network, and some people started commenting without reading without reading the link to the article and said, oh, this is dropping a bucket. Uh, this is an insult, blah, blah, blah. I should have responded, how much did you give? But, okay. But this is, the, the Justice uh, Justice for Greenwood is an African-American nonprofit organization. This money is not coming from uh, the government. All right, so I want people to understand this. So we'll discuss that. Uh, as well on today's show. Now, on the African History Network show, we focus on educating, empowering, and inspiring people of African descent throughout the diaspora and around the world. Because right now, it's correct your own behavior, what you do for yourself, what you do to yourself, and what you allow other people to do to you and get away with is based upon what you think about yourself. What you think about yourself is based upon what you have been taught about yourself. What you've been taught about yourself is based upon everything you've read, heard, and seen about yourself. So when you control the radius of a man or woman's uh, thoughts, you can control the circumference of his or her actions because the mind can't do or teach what it doesn't know. Now, we deal with, the, deal with a number of different topics here on the African History Network show. We deal with current events in history and politics, education, economic empowerment, entrepreneurship, relationships, love, sex, health issues, and much, much more. Sign up for our email newsletter. Text the word Kemet, K-E-M-E-T, the 22828. Sign up for our email newsletter. Text the word Kemet, K-E-M-E-T, the 22828. Sign up for our email newsletter. Also visit our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. You can um, sign up there as well. I uh, want to remind you that the online course that I teach on Saturdays, 12 noon to 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, uh, it's taking place Saturday, June 5th, Ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa, Understanding the Transatlantic Slave Trade, what they didn't teach you in school. Ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa, Understanding the Transatlantic Slave Trade, what they didn't teach you in school. Okay, so we do a thousands of years of history. We do a what led up to the Transatlantic Slave Trade taking place. Uh, you can still register for the online course. Now, we do the class live. Because people say, well, I can't be there at that time or what have you. I say, you know, this is 21st century. You don't have to worry about that. We do the class live. All the sessions are recorded. So you can go back and watch it over and over again. OK, uh, we'll post the link again. It's uh, uh, also at our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. As soon as you register, you can start watching uh, uh, last week's class. You can start watching the course content. Uh, the class is regularly one hundred thirty dollars is on sale. Uh, Sixty dollars. We're about ha we're about halfway through the class. So it's on sale. Sixty dollars. As soon as you register, you can start watching the content. And I talked to Dr. David M. Hotel. Uh, yesterday, uh, he was out of out of town. He was on vacation for three weeks. Uh, he and his wife are on vacation. So he's going to be speaking to my class on Saturday, June 12th. OK, Saturday, June 12th. Dr. David M. Hotep, author of the book, The First Americans Were Africans, Documented Evidence. So we'll talk about the African presence in this country going back at least 51,700 years ago before Native Americans came into existence. We'll talk about his new book as well that um, he's finishing up. Um, he's trying to get the uh, footnotes and index done. So we're going to have a good conversation uh, in my online class with uh, Dr. David M. Hotep on Saturday, June 12th. So be sure to register for that. All right, I wanna jump into uh, the story here before uh, we come up on a break. 
want to deal with um, the Okoye Massacre. Okoye Massacre in 1920. So this, uh, this week, Florida Governor Ron DeSantis signed the state budget bill that includes a scholarship program for descendants of the victims of one of Florida's bloodiest incidents of racial violence. One of Florida's bloodiest incidents of racial violence. And Florida does have a lot of them, by the way. Uh, Axe Handle, uh, Axe Handle Saturday, that 1960, Axe, Axe Handle Saturday. They have a lot of them in Florida. Uh, the scholarship is a rare instance of reparations for wrongs committed against African Americans in the U.S. Um, State Representative Randolph Bracey, it is called the Randolph Bracey Okoy Scholarship Program, named for uh, the item's state senator, state senator, I should say, not state representative, state senator Randolph Bracey. It will award 50 college scholarships of up to $6,100 for students whose ancestors were victims of the 1920 Okoy Massacre, which was an election day massacre, an election day bloodbath that targeted African-American voters in central Florida, uh, in the central Florida city of Okoy, Florida. Uh, I want to go to this clip here. This is from, we're going to go to clip one, uh, Shakita. This is from uh, Fox Channel 13 uh, there in the uh, Florida area. Let's go to this clip. Voting day violence in the country took place not far from here in the town of Okoe. Today, a new scholarship fund was signed into law that will directly benefit descendants of the Okoe massacre victims. And Fox 13's Captain Holly has more. The Okoe election day riot happened in 1920, all because a black man tried to exercise his legal right to vote. Homes and churches were torched, an unknown number of African Americans were killed, and almost all of the estimated 280 black residents living in Ikoe were driven out of town. It decimated this city. Uh, it destroyed these people's lives. This is such a milestone in, in this fight for justice for what happened. State Senator Randolph Bracey has championed turning this traumatic past into a brighter future. Starting this fall, the massacre will be taught in Florida classrooms and now the descendants of the victims will be compensated. The state had a role to play in it. The state deputized the mob in 1920 in Okoe. And so uh, there is a fiscal responsibility to, to repay these folks for what the state did. Included in this year's budget is the Randolph Bracey Okoe Scholarship. The state putting aside $305,000 annually to help 50 students. Those who apply must be related to a victim of the massacre, no matter what city or state they live in now. Any leftover funds will be awarded to African-American residents of Okoe. I think it speaks to unity and our society recognizing what happened. And I think it, it, it really provides healing for the descendants and for our community here in Okoe. Additional eligibility requirements should be available through the Department of Education in July. Catherine Hawley. Fox 13 News. Okay, so we're going to deal with this on the other side of the break. That was uh, State Senator um, Bracey that you heard there, uh, State Senator Randolph Bracey. When we come back, he was interviewed by Roland Martin on Roland Martin Filter today. I did not get a chance to ask any questions. We had a packed show uh, today, but I wanted to deal with this topic since we talked about the Okoye Massacre uh, before on this show. All right, you listen to the African History Network show right here on 910 AM, the Superstation of Future Radio. I'm Michael M. Hotel. We'll be back in a few minutes. Stand by. The Super Station, the oldest radio station in town since 1922. We all know the cannabis industry is headed toward an uprise in the past decade. What happens when there is a brand that brings this uprise in a blow? The cannabis industry welcomes her uprise. Hustle her hemp. Delivering excellence with pride is her watchword, and how you choose to embrace it makes it a priority. 
From cultivating rich cannabis into exquisite and tastefully finished CBD products to delivery, Hustler Hemp leaves no stone unturned. Hustle Her Hemp's mission is to empower women of color by building business and creating legacies, uniting beauty, health, and business. We are a pure definition of how we want the CBD industry to become in the future. While we are redefining innovation, we bring the same energy to improving the quality of life. Hustle Her Hemp is the new Uprise. For 25 years, the Black History 101 Mobile Museum has carried on the rich legacy of the Black Museum movement in America by showcasing original artifacts of the Black experience at colleges, universities, K-12 schools, corporations, libraries, conferences, and cultural events, making it the most traversed Black History mobile exhibit in American history. Dr. Khalid El Hakim is the founder of the Black History 101 Mobile Museum, and he is a highly sought after public speaker on topics of black history, social studies, education, museum studies, hip hop and race relations. Dr. Khalid was named among the change makers for NBC Universal's Erase the Hate campaign and listed as one of the 100 men of distinction for black enterprise. He recently founded the Michigan Hip Hop Archive on the campus of Western Michigan University. The Black History 101 Mobile Museum is currently scheduling in-person and virtual exhibits nationwide. For more information, please contact Dr. Khalid Al-Hakim directly at 313-645-4197, 313-645-4197. Or visit their website at blackhistorymobilemuseum.com. That's blackhistorymobilemuseum.com. You can also email him at bhistory101 at yahoo.com. bhistory101 at yahoo.com. Welcome back to the African History Network show right here on Antony and the Superstation of Future Radio. I'm your host, Brother Michael M. Hotel. It is Friday, June 4th, 2021, and we are live. Okay, uh, call in numbers 313-778-7600. 313-778-7600 is the call in number if you have a question or comment. So right before the break, we were talking about the um, Okoye Massacre of 1921. Okay, the Okoye Massacre of 1921. This was a uh, race massacre. This was the worst uh this was the worst election day uh, race massacre in the history of this country. And you had at least 50 African-Americans who were killed. All right. And they were trying to uh, exercise their right to vote. This took place in Okoy, Florida. So, you know, we've talked about this uh, on the show before you have a state bill uh, in the, in the, um, uh, the Governor Ron DeSantis of Florida, a uh, Trump supporter, he has signed a, a inside the state budget. There is a portion of the state budget that deals with uh, scholarships for the descendants of the Akoi massacre. OK, and it will award. Uh, 50 scholarships of up to $6,100 each for students whose ancestors were victims. Now, this is a uh, now other African-American students in Akoi will also be eligible for the funds. Uh, the scholarship will be a $300,000, $305,000 recurring appropriation from the state's general fund and will be available indefinitely according to uh, State Senator Randolph Bracey. Uh, there's an article here from well, this one. The first one is from uh, the Washington Post. We talked about this um, back in 2020 when I dealt with this topic here on the show in 2020. This is from uh, November 2nd, 2020, the 100th anniversary of the Okoye massacre. Uh, this article from the Washington Post, a white mob unleashed the worst election day violence in U.S. history in Akoi, Florida. A white mob unleashed the worst 
election day violence in U.S. history in in Florida a century ago. Now, this also took place on the day that women uh, voted nationally nationally for the first time, November 2nd, 1920, because of the um, uh, 19th Amendment, okay, which gave women the right to vote. Okay, uh, I want to go to, we're going to go to clip two here, uh, Shakita. Um, the scholarship is a rare instance, and let me flip over to this other article here. This is from uh, Miami New Times, this article here, Florida approved scholarship fund as reparations for 1920 massacre. This is from June 4th, 2021. Florida approved scholarship fund as reparations for 1920 massacre. Now, uh, State Senator Randolph Bracey tried to do more in 2019. A previous bill that he introduced sought to award descendants of the massacre uh, of the massacre victims uh, reparation payments of up to one hundred and fifty thousand dollars each. But that bill did not move forward. All right. And let me flip over. Um, I'm going to scroll down in this article some here. We can zoom in on this. So oftentimes you hear people say, oh, that's not enough. They need more, blah, 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 all this stuff. OK, and then you ask them what they're doing and they get you hear crickets. Um, so he tried to do more in 2019, but that wasn't going anywhere. That didn't work. So they're going this way. All right. And when you read this article, he said he had to be smooth with it. He had to be smooth about it. If you've been watching this show, you know that I've said before, when you study the history of slavery in this country, there was a reason why most slaves who ran away ran away at nighttime and not in the daytime. If you study the history of slavery in this country, there's a reason why most slaves who ran away ran away at nighttime and not in the daytime. They knew running away at nighttime they would have a better chance of running away and staying gone, not getting caught. So it doesn't matter whether you call it reparations, restitution, don't matter what you call it, as long what matters is what you can get past. Doesn't matter what you call it, what matters is what you can get past. It doesn't matter what hypothetical dollar amount you come up with. Doesn't matter what you owe. What matters is how much you can collect. See, this is where theory meets reality. It doesn't matter. You know, 27 trillion, all this. It don't matter how much you owe. What matters is how much you can actually collect. If you can't collect it, what good is talking about all these hypothetical numbers? I, I read one study that said we're owed six quadrillion dollars. Six quadrillion doesn't even exist. It doesn't matter how much you owe. What matters is how much you can collect. That deals with results. Okay? Because you have a whole lot of people just dealing with all these hypotheticals and all, 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 all this theory and all this BS. But no, but can't produce any results. So uh, the scholarship is a rare instance. And let's go back to the article here. Uh, this week, Governor Don, uh, Ron DeSantis, who needs to be voted out of office, still needs to be voted out of office. J just because just, just you signed. The, now, this was in. See, they were smart. This wasn't a separate bill. OK, this was in the state budget. See, see, there was, there, there was a reason why most slaves who ran away at night ran away at nighttime, not in the daytime. You have to be smart about this. OK, put it in the state budget. They want to approve it. Most of them ain't going to read the state budget because they're lazy. Slide it up in there. This week, Florida Governor Ron DeSantis signed a state budget bill that includes a scholarship program for descendants of the victims of one of Florida's bloodiest incidents of racial violence. The scholarship is a rare instance of reparations for wrongs committed against African-Americans in the U.S. The Randolph Bracey Accoy Scholarship program named for the 
uh, item sponsor, State Senator Randolph Bracey, will award $50 scholarships of up to $6,100, up to $6,100 for students whose ancestors were victims of the 1920 Okoye massacre, an election day bloodbath that targeted black voters in the central Florida city. The bill governor Ron DeSantis side makes no explicit mention of the terms reparations and intentional omission on the part of his sponsor and intentional. See, this is strategy. You got to understand how white people think and you have to outmaneuver them. An intentional omission on the part of his sponsor Senator, uh, State Senator Randolph Bracey, to help it pass through the Florida State Legislature. It don't matter what it's called. What matters is what you can get passed. All this hypothetical and you owe us this and all that, that don't mean nothing if you can't get the bill passed. They, they were actually able to get something accomplished. Other African-American students in Akoi will also be eligible for the funds. The scholarship will be a $305,000 recurring appropriation from the state's general fund and will be available, quote unquote, indefinitely, according to State Senator Randolph Bracey. This is also an example of how elections have consequences. In the days leading up to the November 2nd, 1920, um, in the days leading up to November 2nd, 1920, Ku Klux Klan members marched through African-American neighborhoods in a coy threatening African-American residents not to vote. That, that, that sounds like voter suppression. That sounds like voter suppression to me. They were threatening not to vote. Not only that, if we, I'm going to go back to the piece that we discussed on the 100th anniversary, November 2nd, 2020. Uh, the piece from the Zen Education Project. Because the Ku Klux Klan terrorized two African-American communities the day before the election and threatened them, threatened them not to vote. If we look at this here from the uh, Zen Education Project, November 2nd, 1920, the Okoye Massacre. Now, this is Julius July Perry who was killed. He was lynched. You, we're going to deal with this story. Then we're going to go to the interview that Roland Martin did today with uh, State Senator uh, Randolph Bracey. In response to an attempt by African-Americans to exercise their legal and democratic right to vote, at least 50 African-Americans were murdered. At least 50 were murdered in a brutal massacre in Okoye, Florida on November 2nd, 1920, in what is now called the Okoye Massacre. OK, so. Um, on November 1st, th th this uh, this description comes from a on fire, the 1920 Election Day massacre, a quiet Florida citrus town became the scene of a gruesome racial cleansing that purged the entire black population for over 60 years. But. You think your vote doesn't matter. If if voting didn't matter, what what why they go through the trouble to kill us? On November 1st, 1920, the day before the election, this was a presidential election, white robes and crosses, the Ku Klux Klan paraded through the streets of the two African American communities in Akoi, Florida, late into the night. OK, they're going through terrorizing us. With megaphones, they warned that not a single Negro will be permitted to vote. With megaphones, they're going through the African-American community, terrorizing us. And on megaphones, they're shouting, quote, not a single Negro will be permitted to vote, end quote. And if any of them dare to do so, there would be dire consequences. Election day came and at least some African-Americans did attempt to vote in Orange County, Florida. However, none were permitted to enter their respective polling places. White enforcers, white enforcers camped out around the centers and poll workers were given instructions to deflect 
their attempts. This reminds me of the 147 traitors in the House of Representatives that voted not to certify the presidential election. This reminds me of the uh, 360, well, it's almost 400 bills now in 47 state legislatures that Republicans are pushing to do the same thing that the white enforcers did, except now they're trying to do it at the state legislature to suppress the vote, these voter restriction bills. They want to do the same thing that the white enforcers did. One by one, would-be African-American voters were turned away either by threats of violence, like the January 6th insurrection with the white domestic terrorists. One by one, would-be African-American voters were turned away either by threats of violence or by poll workers who found their names mysteriously absent from the voter registration rolls. If some of these poll workers were alive today, they would probably be down in Maricopa, uh, Arizona, involved in that fake recount, the fraud. It. They'd probably be involved in that. These these, if they, if these people were alive today, they would be Trump supporters. They would be perpetuating the big lie. They would be supporting the domestic terrorists that try to overthrow the government January 6th and interrupt a constitutionally mandated uh, uh, certification of the vote tallies from 50 states. One by one, would be African American voters were turned away either by threats of violence or by poll workers who found their names mysteriously absent from the voter rolls. Pollsters instructed them to get documentation from Notary Public, not, uh, from Notary Public R.C. Bigelow. I don't think he's related to Bam Bam Bigelow, the, the wrestler. Okay, <laughs> R.C. Bigelow to verify that they were indeed registered to vote. How many white people had to go to R.C. Bigelow and get verification that they were registered to vote? I'm just curious. I, I, I'm just wondering. Conveniently, R.C. Bigelow was unable to be located because he was out on a fishing trip that day. Well, what, what, well hold on, Bigelow. You, that was election day. You go fishing on election day? You're the notary public. You go fishing on election day. Okay. With little other option, most African Americans return to their homes without casting their ballots. You had an African American man named Mose Norman. Mose Norman would not be so easily deterred. He said, ain't, he said, we ain't gonna let these white supremacists turn us around, turn us around. Now, after being turned away that morning in his Okoy, uh, Florida precinct, he rode to Orlando, Florida to seek the counsel of Judge Cheney. The attorney instructed him to write down the names of any African-Americans who were not permitted to vote and also the names of the poll workers who had denied their constitutional right to vote. They spun the 15th Amendment. Now, Judge Cheney said a lawsuit against the county could be brought to contest this violation. Mose Norman returned to Okoy, Florida with these instructions along with a handful of African-American citizens, at, again, seeking to vote. As you can imagine, things did not go well. After again being forcibly turned away, Mose Norman demanded the poll workers' names and exclaimed, quote, we will vote by God, end quote. The response by the domestic terrorists, the Ku Klux Klan, and I'm sure some of their ancestors, some of their descendants were involved in the insurrection on January 6th, where they were, where they were shouting, hang Mike Pence, hang Mike Pence, and they built the gala with a hangman's noose. They attacked police officers, Capitol Police, 140 of 140 Capitol Police injured. We know one died from injury sustained there. Two others committed suicide. So the response from this domestic terrorist organization known as the Ku Klux Klan was a massacre. One of the people killed was Julius July Perry. Let's bring up a picture of Julius July Perry. 
Uh, we got that. What do we got? Okay, let me pull this up. Junius, I thought I had it up. Oh, here we go. Uh, one one African American uh, kill was Julius July Perry. He was lynched. Okay, we're going to tell you what happened to Julius July Perry and, and what happened with these domestic terrorists. So now you have the white nationalist party. Now you have the GOP that's become the white nationalist party. The QAnon party, the conspiracy party, the, the Trump party, the insurrectionist party. Now they don't want the joint commission, the bipartisan commission to investigate what happened with the insurrection. Well, I, I wonder what, what is it that you're afraid of? You, you, you're afraid some of you are going to be implicated and, and indicted? Is that what you're afraid of? All right, let's go to this one here. Okay. So we've got Julius July Perry up. Uh, where is that article? Okay. Right here. All right, here we go. So, Zen Education Project, that's what I want. All right, let me go back to the article from the Zen Education Project. So the response from the Ku Klux Klan was a massacre. One of the people who was killed, he was lynched, Julius July Perry. July was his nickname. Here's a description of Julius July Perry from the documentary, A Coy on Fire. July Perry had become the well-respected godfather of the African-American community. He served as a deacon in the church and the local labor leader or straw boss. It is said that anyone seeking to employ African-American laborers needed to speak with Julius July Perry first. He was an admired brave and rational thinker, a sort of civil rights leader before there was a civil rights movement. He encouraged young African-Americans to be educated and stand up for themselves as first-class citizens. He probably tell the men to pull their pants up off their behinds and the women don't come outside with bonnets on. Julius July Perry's wife, Estelle, his three sons and daughter, uh, Caritha, uh, uh, and his daughter, Caritha Perry Caldwell, lived on a large estate that included their home and several barns and outbuildings. He was very successful. He's a very successful African-American man. The, the, he, he, he's the type that um, the 40 percent of white people, August 4th, 2018, in that survey from YouGov that said uh, African-Americans could be equally successful as white people if they just tried harder. But they don't want to talk about the Tulsa race massacre that largely destroyed what we built up, trying harder. Um, we're going to tell you what happened to uh, his land that he tried hard to build. Um, they regularly opened their doors, uh, July Perry and his family, they regularly opened their doors to anyone in need. If anyone was in, if anyone was in trouble, they knew they could find advice and sanctuary in the Perry home. Now, let me see here. What else is here? Okay. Uh, I want to flip over to the article from Miami New Times. Uh, very briefly here. Let me see. Do I have the rest of that? I thought I did. Okay. From the Miami New Times. Um, so after the polls closed, uh, well, let me back up. In the days leading up to November 2nd, 1920, Ku Klux Klan members marched through black neighborhoods threatening African-American residents not to vote. In defiance of the threats, Mose Norman, an African-American Okoy resident, made multiple attempts to reach the ballot box, okay? Um, but each time he was turned away by white poll workers. 
after the polls closed, a mob of deputized white men carrying guns came in search of Moles Norman. Because he tried to vote, he demanded the names of white poll workers that were turning him around. He was following the law. A mob of deputized white men, like the deputized white men that were involved in the Tulsa race massacre. They uh, went in search of Mose Norman, who was thought to have taken refuge in the home of his friend, Julius July Perry. Mose Norman wasn't there, but Julius July Perry was, and he fought back, rightfully so, engaging in a gunfight with members of the white domestic terrorist mob. Julius July Perry was captured and taken to an Orange County jail where he was later kidnapped and lynched and left bullet ridden and hanging outside of the home of the federal judge who advised him on voting rights. It was Judge Cheney. They, they took him out, the, they kidnapped him, took him out the jail, shot him, and then left and, and left him hanging outside of Judge Cheney's home for exercising his right to vote for, for following the law. This is this is what happened. I want to go to uh, the interview that Roland Martin did today with uh, State Senator uh, Randolph Bracey about the uh, uh, scholarship reparations that he was able to get passed in the state legislature. Let's go to this clip of Shakita. In Florida, a scholarship program will serve as reparation for descendants of the victims of a massacre in 1920, the Okoye Massacre. The U.S. The U.S. First of all, the U.S. Randolph Bracey Okoye Scholarship Program uh, will award 50 college scholarships for up to up to $6,100 to the descendants. Sponsor of the bill is Florida State Senator Randolph Bracey. He joins us right now. Glad to have you on the show. Um, so this was similar. Didn't Florida do the exact same thing for Rosewood, creating scholarships? They did. They did. Thank you for having me on the show. They did. Uh, what they also did was they paid directly the descendants in a cash payment. This was in the early 1990s. And then they had a scholarship program that still goes on to this day. Uh, for the descendants of Rosewood. This is unique in that we are paying the descendants, uh, not a cash payment, but a scholarship program. Descendants have first dibs on it, but then after that, African-American students in Okoe can apply for it. So they don't even have to be direct descendants. They uh, just have to be of African-American descent and they can qualify for the scholarship. Uh, this, of course, was a lot of work uh, getting Florida to, first of all, acknowledge what took place uh, and even get to this point right here. Yeah, absolutely. So last year, I had a bill that required that the public schools teach uh, about the Okoye Massacre of 1920. A lot of people don't realize this was the deadliest day in political history. It happened on Election Day 1920. Their property, their land was stolen. But what, what incited the violence was that they organized to go out and vote in the 1920 presidential election. And, and that's what uh, created, that's what ensued the, the, the violence. And so um, it, it is quite a historic uh, event that, that a lot of people just don't know about it. But that bill passed last year where it had to be taught in schools. This year I worked on reparations. And so I'm uh, very proud to say that, that we got that done. Uh, and so you talked about not just descendants. And so uh, is it a maximum number of 50 a year? Yes. No, it, it, it's 50 a year. Every year it's recurring indefinitely uh, for $6,100. Each student gets that amount, exact amount. So it, it is a total of $305,000. This was just the first step. I plan to expand it uh, to more than 50 students next year. But, but this was the starting point. And this is funding for the state of Florida. Yes, the state of Florida uh, is funding this initiative. For the folks who do not know about this particular massacre, just give them uh, some history of what actually took place in there in Florida. Yes, so a man named July Perry is really uh, the person that is most known for it. He was a wealthy black man who owned a considerable amount of land. He was like the broker in town 
when folks wanted to come and maybe hire some some workers, he controlled the city and he owned a considerable amount of land. He already uh, drew the ire of the white folks in because of how, how wealthy he was back in 1920. And so not only was he wealthy, but now he organized the black community community in Okoe to vote. And they all went down to the election, uh, the election place on, on election day. And they were greeted with guns, a uh, fight ensued, and they all ran for their lives. Uh, the mob was, was uh, formed. They went through the black community looking for July Perry. They burned down the, the homes of the black people in that town. Everyone was forced to leave. Up to 60 people were killed that day. Um, and they found July Perry. They hung him. And... And, uh, and and that was the story. Uh, later after that, the Orange County government transferred all of the property to members of the mob. Um, many of them got nothing. This land is worth $20, 30000000 million today. And that's a low estimate. And, uh, and that's the story. After that day, uh, not, there was about 500 people of black people in, ni- in 1920 in Ocoee. The census showed that next year they were all gone. No one moved back to Okoe till the 1980s. It was what they call a sundown town, even in the 60s, where black people could not even be seen there after dark, uh, or, or most likely they'd be killed or hurt. So uh, it's had a lot lasting impact in the city of Okoe, right here in Central Florida. Uh, well, uh, this is certainly uh, good news, and the fact that it's, it's indefinite. Uh, is very important as well. And so it's not like a five or 10 year cap. No, no. Just like uh, Rosewood, we passed that in 1992, I believe. It, it, those scholarships are still available. Uh, it, it, it starts now and I believe it, it'll go on indefinitely. All right, then. Oh, well, look, we certainly appreciate it. Great work uh, here, uh, Senator Bracey. And uh, it was great to see you. We were there in Orlando. So glad to see um, uh, this actually happening. Uh, for uh, the folks there uh, in Florida, for the black kids there in Florida. Uh, hey, thank you. I appreciate it. I'll be running for uh, Congress also. I just wanted to mention that District 10, our, our Congresswoman Val Demon is going to be running for U.S. Senate against Marco Rubio. So I'm looking to continue the work I've been doing in the state legislature. Uh, I think you're the third person I know who's running there, so that's going to be a, a, a highly contested seat. Okay, yeah. pause, pause it right there. All right. Peter. We'll be- All right, thanks. Okay, so excellent interview. So that was today. Uh, uh, the, uh, the panel did not get a chance to ask State, uh, State Senator Bracey any questions. I was on the panel on Roller Martin and Filter today, uh, but I wanted to make sure we talked about this story uh, today on my show. Uh, very quickly here, I want to go back to this article very quickly, and then we have a quick announcement to make as well. Um, the, they talked about the, um, the land. Okay, they t- uh, let me go back here. Uh, after the gun, see, as the polls close, after the gunfight, um, after the gunfight with uh, Julius July Perry, the mob turned its attention to the rest of the community, burning down uh, black owned homes and churches. Burning down black owned homes and churches. Uh, where is that in here? Okay. It is, okay, burning down black-owned homes and churches. Many black residents fled, and Okoy became a sundown town, a place where um, a, a place where African-Americans were warned to leave by nightfall for their own safety. The total number of African-American residents who died in the rampage is un- unknown, but the death toll is estimated to be between 30 and 60 people. The death toll is estimated to be between 30 and 60 people. Okay. Uh, okay. Right here after the gunfight. Okay. Very quick announcement here before we run out of time. Um, let me see. Let me pull this up here. Okay. Uh, quick announcement here from uh, 910. Uh, Turn your faith into action with Pastor Robert Tilton on Thursday, June 24th at 7.30 p.m. at the Weston Hotel in Southfield, Michigan. Receive deliverance from troublesome issues and prayer from Pastor Robert Tilton himself. Again, turn your faith into action 
with Pastor Robert Tilton on Thursday, June 24, 2021 at 7.30 p.m. at the Western Hotel in Southfield, Michigan. Come expecting a miracle. Uh, they will see you there. All right. Now, this uh, right here, do we, we have this up here. Let's go. To this. Okay. So they're going to uh, take his land as well. A um, An investigation uh, by WFTV revealed that July Perry's, Julius July Perry's land was wrongfully taken from his family and that the land deed was amended years after his death to prohibit it from being sold to another African-American. That's a restrictive covenant. They wrongfully took his land and then they prohibited from being sold to anybody else in the deed. Okay. A restrictive covenant. All right. Uh, now the, uh, in Cobra, the national coalition for blacks for reparations in Cobra, uh, defines reparations. And they have this here, uh, in Cobra defines reparations as a process of repairing, healing, and restoring a people injured because of their group identity and in violation of their fundamental human rights by governments, corporations, institutions, and uh, families. We'll continue this uh, in just a minute here. We're out of time right here on 9, 10 a.m. The Superstation, The Future Radio. Um, if you like this type of information, you want to support the African History Network, uh, dollar sign the AHN show through Cash App, dollar sign the AHN show through Cash App. Also through PayPal, paypal.me forward slash the AHN show. Be sure to do dollar sign the AHN show. These other African History Network accounts are fake. As I said before, our, our, uh, uh, cash, uh, our cash app tag is dollar sign the AHN show, S-H-O-W. These other ones are fake, okay? If you donated to these other fake ones, contact cash app. Let them know that you were scammed. Ask them to refund your money and you can send it to the right one here. Uh, it shows it ha has my name, Michael, and it shows my picture there, okay? The other two are the fake ones. This is the real one. We'll post a link here because uh, they've been stealing money from us, okay? So I've already reported them to uh, Cash App, but I'm putting this out because I've talked to other people who said that they donated to the fake one as well. I talked to somebody yesterday, okay? And she sent me some, she sent me some documentation uh, they've been, uh, my, I set my account up in December, 2019. As you see these other ones, they were set up in like Jan one was set up January, 2021. Okay. So if, if, if you were scammed by these other fake ones, contact cash app and let them know. Uh, you can also uh, support us through PayPal, paypal.me forward slash the AHN show. We just posted the link here also at our website, africanhistorynetwork.com and be sure to register for the online course I teach on Saturdays, uh, 12 noon to 2 PM Eastern standard time. Right now, it's Chris Rome Behavior. It's not over till we win. We're kind of forever. And uh, we'll talk to you on Sunday. Peace. Okay, stand by, everybody. Stand by. Uh, let me continue here. All right. Uh, so I'll be in Atlanta uh, speaking at the Juneteenth uh, Festival, Juneteenth uh, Parade and Music Festival, uh, Saturday, Friday, July 18th through Sunday, uh, July 20th. So when you support the African History Network, that helps us keep doing the research, stay on the air, keep broadcasting six days a week. We're here six days a week uh, to help me get to Atlanta and get back, et cetera. All right. And you can still register for the online course that I teach. Um, we do the class live. All right. Saturdays, 12 noon to 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. All the sessions are recorded. You can go back and watch it over and over again. Uh, even after the uh, course is over with, the nine-week online course, even after it's over with, you, you still have access to the class. So if you go to our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, and, sc and scroll down, you'll see the information. The next class, Saturday, June 5th. Uh, click right here to register. Class is 54% uh, off right now, so it's on sale, $60, regularly $130. Click right here to enroll. We're about halfway through the class. Uh, so as soon as you register, you can watch last week's class. We're going to have a fantastic class Saturday, June 5th. Saturday, June 12th, our guest speaker is going to be Dr. David M. Hotel, author of the book, The First Americans Were African, Documented Evidence. He's going to do an exclusive presentation for our class only. OK, um, so you don't want to miss that. He's going to deal with um, 
evidence of the African presence in this land we call the United States of America, going back at least 51,700 years. To talk about new research for his new book, The First Americans Were Africans Revisited, and some other uh, some other things as well. So that uh, he'll be uh, speaking to my class uh, Saturday, June 12, 2021. We posted the link here. You can register for the course. And um, the Juneteenth uh, Festival, uh, visit JuneteenthATL.com, JuneteenthATL.com uh, for more information. I'll be speaking on Saturday, June 18th and Sunday, June 19th, 3 p.m. both days at the uh, amphitheater. OK, uh, the ninth annual Juneteenth uh, Parade, Atlanta Parade and Music Festival is taking place at Centennial Olympic Park, Centennial Olympic Park, Friday, June 18th through Sunday, June 20th. It's free and open to the public. They have the times here as well. Uh, they have all types of uh, acts and programs and musical acts. There's about 100 to 130 vendors usually each year, African-American, Caribbean, African vendors. Angie Stone will be performing this year. She's a head, headliner act once again. So check that out. All right. Uh, let me go back to the, uh, I want to go back to the article here from uh, Miami New Times dealing with um, the Koi Massacre and the uh, scholarship uh, program, the reparations and scholarship program. So in COBRA, National Coalition of Blacks for Reparations in America, defines reparations as a process of repairing, healing, and restoring people. A process of repairing, healing, and restoring a people uh, injured because of their group identity and in violation of their fundamental of their fundamental human rights by governments, corporations, institutions, and families. End quote. Now in Cobra in Cobra names cash payments, land, uh, economic, economic development, scholarships, and community development as examples of reparations, as examples of reparations. Now, State Senator uh, Randolph Bracey takes a similarly broad view of reparations, defining them as compensation for past wrongs, particularly with regard to injustices against people of color uh, perpetrated by or sanctioned by government institutions. He said, I think particularly when you're talking about uh, government involvement or the government turning a blind eye, when they're supposed to be there to serve the people, when you have instances of violence where people are not protected by the government, that is a situation where reparations is owed. Okay, so read the rest of this article here. This is from um, Miami New Times, Miami New Times uh, dot com, I think it is. Yeah, my, Miami New Times dot com. Florida approves scholarship fund as reparations for a 1920 massacre. Yes, we want them to have more, but you're dealing with a Florida state legislature. So you get what you can get where you can get it. They, he was smart. He, he, he didn't, the language of the bill didn't say reparations, and he put it within the state budget. The state budget has to pass. He slipped it into the state budget. As I said before, there's a reason why most slaves who ran away at nighttime ran away. There's a reason why most slaves who ran away ran away at nighttime and not in the daytime. Okay. And they didn't tell them the slave master uh, before they ran away and say, we're going to run away tonight. It's been nice knowing you. All right. Last story. So we know Tuesday was the 100th commemoration of the Tulsa race massacre. Uh, media from all over the country was uh, in Tulsa on Tuesday and they were going by Wednesday. Tulsa became like a sundown town because uh, they were going by nighttime uh, <laughs> Wednesday. And you watch a lot of the news coverage the next day at like Tuesday didn't even happen. But one thing that did happen was uh, the three survivors of the Tulsa race massacre uh, Mother Viola Fletcher, 100 years old. Uh, Mother Leslie Benningfield Randall, 
106 years old, and Mother Fletcher's brother, Hughes Van Ellis, 100 years old. That's her little brother, right? <laughs> He's 100 years old. That's her little brother. Um, the Justice for Greenwood Foundation, the Justice for Greenwood Foundation, has uh, gifted them uh, each $100,000, okay? Gifted them each $100,000. Now, this is not a substitute for reparations, okay? But you're a long way from getting reparations, I'm telling you right now. This, uh, that ain't about to happen. And as I've said before, you know, political, uh, uh, there was a meeting that Joe Biden had with uh, some African-American leaders and said, don't expect much on reparations coming from the Senate. Hell, I've been telling you that. I've been telling you that for months. Rep H.R. 40 ain't passing the U.S. Senate. You need 10 Republicans to vote for H.R. 40. Name me, name me two Republicans in the Senate that are going to vote for H.R. 40. And Tim Scott is not one of them. Because he already said he's not voting for reparations. So if the black Republican in the Senate is not going to vote for reparations. How many white Republicans you think going to vote for? It? This is this is what this is, that ain't happening. We don't we don't understand math. And you don't even have 218 votes in the House of Representatives. You had like about 183, 188 supporters in the House of Representatives. They're all Democrats. No Republicans are supporting that. Not even the black Republicans in the House of Representatives. I suppose Burgess Owens of uh Utah. He ain't supporting reparations. So you don't have 218 in, in the House of Representatives and you and you nowhere near 60 votes in the Senate. You don't even have four. I doubt if you, I doubt even if you have 40 votes in the Senate. And that's all that still all be Democrats. No Republicans are voting for reparations. No Republicans, they ain't even vote for a reparations study in the Senate. No Republicans are voting for that. Sometimes people don't want to face reality. They want to keep believing Santa Claus exists or some nonsense. Um, TheGrio.com has an article about this. Tulsa race massacre survivors, remaining Tulsa survivors, receive $100,000 each from the Justice for Greenwood Foundation. Now, before people start saying they deserve more, that ain't nothing, all this stuff. One, how much did you donate? Two, Justice for Greenwood is an African-American nonprofit organization. That's not coming from city government, state government, no government. That's coming from largely us, okay? That's who that's coming from. That ain't coming from the government. That's not coming from the city of Tulsa. That ain't coming from county. That ain't coming from state. That is not coming from federal government, all right? We, we talked about, uh, uh, was it Wednesday show, uh, June 2nd, how Governor G.T. Bynum, his, uh, his family, Throughout history, owned 931 slaves. These against reparations. The white mayor, Donald Trump supporter, Republican, the white mayor of Tulsa, Oklahoma, his family owned 931 slaves, going back to like 1665. Owned 931 slaves collectively, collectively, but he's against reparations. So there was a article. Let me see. I want to go to this clip here. This is from, um, which one is this? Yeah, News uh, uh, Channel 6. Channel 6 there in the Tulsa, Oklahoma area. They ran this story. 1921 Tulsa race massacre survivors receive $100,000, receive $100,000 checks from Justice for Greenwood Foundation. From Justice for Greenwood Foundation. Let me pull this up here. So, and, you know, we've, we've talked about this before because we've been dealing with the Tulsa Race Massacre every day. And you know, we were talking about it even before the commemoration came up, things like this. The entire co community has to have restitution because there was an entire community that was attacked, attacked twice because we rebuilt the Greenwood District. It was thriving again, even in 1926 when Dr. W.B. Bois visited. He wrote about it. It was thriving in the 1950s and 60s, okay? But the expressways come through starting in about 1970 because of the U.S. Interstate Highway Acts in 1952 and 1956. Uh, U.S. Uh, uh, Interstate Highway 244 and U.S. Freeway 75 come through and wipe out businesses and homes are taken through uh, eminent domain, okay? So I want to go to uh, this clip here. We'll cue this up. 
with cue this up now survivors of the 1921 Tulsa race massacre uh will be gifted now, actually they did receive the money this um uh this story here is from June 4th All right, so uh, that's from June 4th, 2021, because the article from um, uh, thegrio.com is from June 3rd. So it says that they will be gifted, but uh, they have received uh, the checks. Okay. So, and once again, it's not coming from the government or anything like that. That is coming from the Justice for Greenwood. Uh, and that's coming largely from African Americans. I know color change is um i know they get different donations from different people but this is this stuff is largely coming from african americans and justice for greenwood is an african-american um non-profit organization as well 501c3 let me see if we i was trying to see if we had a, a decent picture uh that's pixelated uh i was trying to get a good picture of them uh receiving their checks but this one pixelated that's not a good picture but anyway so that is something good now they still deserve restitution from the government from city government state government what have you the entire community has to have restitution restitution as well but they were saying this is something we can do now we don't have to wait on legislation we don't have to wait on the government all this stuff this is something we can do now okay all right, now, um, uh, Demario uh, Solomon Simmons, we have a statement from him as well. Uh, and he, he's the attorney who filed the lawsuit uh, last year. Let me see here, Justice for Greenwood. Uh, uh, Demario Solomon Simmons, founder and executive director of justice for greenwood uh said and he, he said we are immensely proud to play our role in rectifying these injustices nothing can be uh nothing can do the uh, uh nothing can undo the immense pain inflicted upon the remaining survivors of the massacre but but alleviating their current financial burdens inflicted not only by the massacre itself, but subsequent systemic racism is the least we could do for them as we continue to push for reparations. Now we must work to ensure their stories are told, confronting our past and learning from it to ensure we actively challenge enduring just injustices, okay? All right, so check out this article here. This is from uh, Channel 6, uh, News on 6 in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Look at this article here. Uh, that's the wrong one. That's from, uh, okay. Nineteen twenty one Tulsa race massacre survivors receive one hundred thousand dollar checks from Justice for Greenwood, uh, Justice for Greenwood uh, Foundation. 
uh, the one from thegrio.com is called Remaining Tulsa Survivors Receive $300,000 Gift. Remaining Tulsa Survivors Receive $300,000 Gift. That's from June 3rd, 2021 by Hannah Joy. All right. Um, let's see. Okay, hey, if you like this type of information, you can support the African History Network. Dollar sign the AHN show through Cash App. Dollar sign the AHN show through Cash App. Also through PayPal, paypal.me forward slash the AHN show, paypal.me forward slash the AHN show. As you see, uh, I have up here uh, a, a handy visual aid. Okay, the uh, fake uh, African History Network accounts don't. Don't donate to them. If you donate it to them uh, in your cash app account, there's a option. I think it's problem with payment. Then uh, you can choose uh, the fake account that you sent the money to. You can choose the transaction. And then the next option, choose uh, I've been scammed. OK, report them to uh, cash app. OK, they may ask you what happened, blah, blah, blah. Let them know you're trying to send it to dollar sign the AHN show and you send it to one of these uh, um, fake uh, accounts. All right. And also you can support us through PayPal, paypal.me forward slash the AHN show, paypal.me forward slash the AHN show. Be sure to register for the online course I teach on Saturdays, 12 noon to 2 p.m. East, 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, Ancient Kemet, the Moors. And the Ma'afa, Understanding the Transatlantic Slave Trade, where they didn't teach you in school. Ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa, Understanding the Transatlantic Slave Trade, where they didn't teach you in school. Kemet's one of the original names for Egypt. Okay. Uh, it's a nine-week online course that I teach. I do a PowerPoint presentation. We have book references, guest speakers, articles, all types of information. It's going to blow you away. We do the class live. All the sessions are recorded. Uh, so you can go back and watch it over and over again. Even after the course is over with, you still have access. You can watch it at our website. Uh, scroll down, click on. We have the information here for the class. And click right there, register here and click there to enroll. And then you can start watching the content. All right. We have to get out of here. Remember, the African History Network, you focus on educating, empowering, and inspiring people of African descent throughout the diaspora and around the world. Because right now, it's correct wrong behavior. It's not over till we win Wakanda forever. And uh, we'll be back Sunday. All right. Take care. Have a good day. Peace. Gain knowledge in minutes from insightful summaries of progressive and socially conscious books. Blacklisted gives you access to curated content that will satisfy your curiosity to learn and understand different perspectives. Empower yourself through inspirational and actionable ideas. It's easy to read or listen to on the go. Blacklisted. Empower yourself. Start your free trial today. We all know the cannabis industry is headed toward an uprise in the past decade. What happens when there is a brand that brings this uprise in a blow? The cannabis industry welcomes her uprise. Hustle her hemp. Delivering excellence with pride is her watchword, and how you choose to embrace it makes it a priority. From cultivating rich cannabis into exquisite and tastefully finished CBD products to delivery, Hustler Hemp leaves no stone unturned. Hustler Hemp's mission is to empower women of color by building business and creating legacies, uniting beauty, health, and business. We are a pure definition of how we want the CBD industry to become in the future. While we are redefining innovation, we bring the same energy to improving the quality of life. Hustle Her Hemp is the new Uprise. Hi, I'm Joel Wilson, President and CEO of JCW Computer Consulting LLC, a technology implementation firm with over 20 years of satisfying customers. We offer a full spectrum of industry top tier branded services. We are an authorized partner or reseller for Lenovo, Zoom, T-Mobile, Microsoft 365 and Surface Tablet, Google Workspace, Acer, Asus, Samsung, PCmatic security software, and many more. Our online store features laptops, Chromebooks, computers, printers, accessories, and software. Businesses, 
Take advantage of our free one-hour Zoom tech consultation and know we offer top nationwide high-speed internet service providers, voice over IP, and cellular phone services. Home users, don't miss our current in-stock Chromebook inventory. Please visit us at jcwcc.com or call 215-879-6701. For 25 years, the Black History One-on-One Mobile Museum has carried on the rich legacy of the Black Museum movement in America by showcasing original artifacts of the Black experience at colleges, universities, K-12 schools, corporations, libraries, conferences, and cultural events, making it the most traversed black history mobile exhibit in American history. Dr. Khalid El Hakim is the founder of the Black History One-on-One Mobile Museum, and he is a highly sought after public speaker on topics of black history, social studies, education, museum studies, hip hop, and race relations. Dr. Khalid was named among the change makers for NBC Universal's Erase the Hate campaign and listed as one of the 100 men of distinction for black enterprise. He recently founded the Michigan Hip Hop Archive on the campus of Western Michigan University. The Black History One on One Mobile Museum is currently scheduling in person and virtual exhibits nationwide. For more information, please contact Dr. Khalid Al-Hakim directly at 313-645-4197, 313-645-4197, or visit their website at blackhistorymobilemuseum.com. That's blackhistorymobilemuseum.com. You can also email him at bhistory101 at yahoo.com, bhistory101 at yahoo.com. With blackbusinesstea.com. The messages are clear and meaningful. Keep your business in the black and out of the red. Mind your black business. Know your numbers and plan strategically. Black business boss, lead your industry. Support black business. Encourage, patronize, and uplift one another. BlackBusinessTea.com currently has products sold in Detroit, Atlanta, Chicago, and Los Angeles with proceeds returned to the black community. They have a wide selection of hoodies, t-shirts, mugs, hats, sweatshirts that support black owned businesses. Visit the website blackbusinesstea.com 